All right, tonight I want to speak to you about one of Judah's kings. Actually, it's the fourth king of Judah, and his name is Jehoshaphat. Uh, as you study the book of Kings, 1st, 2nd Kings, as you study the book of 1st, 2nd Chronicles, uh, you'll, you'll hear a lot of the kings mentioned. Okay, you've got David, and then you've got Solomon, and then, of course, the kingdom split. You've got the northern kingdom, which is referred to as Israel, and then the southern kingdom, which is referred to as Judah. And so basically throughout the book of Kings, throughout the book of Chronicles, you have being mentioned the different kings that rule over those two kingdoms. Um, and so uh, you, you'll find as you read through it, a lot of times there's not a whole lot said about a king, but you actually have four chapters going back. I think it's four chapters. Let me check. Well, beginning at chapter 17, 18, 19, and then chapter 20, and let's see, um, and then I think it ends with his son Jehoram taking over in chapter 21. So, four chapters devoted to this individual, this king of Judah named Jehoshaphat, okay? There are a lot of neat things that God has given us, a lot of cool revelation that we have about Jehoshaphat. Now, let, let me give you a couple of things real quick. If you want to hold your place there, and did I tell you to turn to Second Chronicles? Okay, I didn't. Well, we'll hold off on that. Turn in your Bible to Romans real quick. Romans, uh, let me find the chapter. Wasn't planning to use this verse. Well, it's chapter 15 in Romans. Take a moment and look at verse number four there. All right, Romans 15, verse four. Here's what it says about the Old Testament in the New Testament. It says, whatever things were written before were written for our learning. Okay, so that we through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Okay, so what Paul does, he gives us a little insight as to, to one of the purposes for the Old Testament in our lives. In other words, we can look back and we can see from those who walk with God, we can study their lives and we can, we can learn something about experiencing God through them, right? Um, just like we do in, in a sense today through uh, uh, others that God has put, us, put around us that, that do walk with God. We learn a lot from them. And so uh, you have a lot recorded about people like Jehoshaphat to teach us something about experiencing God and about a relationship with Him. Okay, It's not that Jehoshaphat takes center stage because really as you study his life, the hero is the same he hero throughout the Bible. And guess who that is? It's the Lord. It's always the Lord. Okay, so, um, but we do learn something. We do learn something uh, through them uh, that helps us in our lives experience Him. So, these things were written for our learning. So, what can we learn tonight? Second Chronicles chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. We're going to read several passages here or verses here from this chapter, 2 Chronicles chapter number 20. And again, just let me encourage you to continue being faithful through your study of experiencing God. I know we're at a point where it's kind of easy to get busy and, and other things can sort of come in and sort of divert your attention, but I encourage you to be faithful and continue sort of plowing through, just letting God speak to you uh, through this gentleman, learning more about how to experience um, experience him. Second uh, Chronicles chapter number 20. Chapter number 20. Okay? It happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, 
from Syria, and they are in Ha Zazon, I guess that's the way you pronounce it, Tamar, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared. And he set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah in Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And he said, O Lord God, our fathers, of our fathers, are you not God in heaven and do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people? Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham your friend forever and they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name saying if disaster comes upon us sword judgment pestilence or famine we will stand before this temple and in your presence and cry out to you in our affliction and you will hear and say and now here are the people of Ammon Moab and Mount Seir and you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and did not destroy them. And here they are now rewarding us by, throwing, by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? Because we have no, no power against this great multitude that is coming out against us. Nor do we know what to do, but... Our eyes are upon you. Now all of Judah with their little ones, their wives and their children, stood before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zerah, Zechariah, the son of Beniah, the son of Jeel, the son of Mattaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. And he said, Listen, all you of Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you. Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, because the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow I go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourself, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah. And Jerusalem. Now let me ask you a question. Does that really make a lot of sense? I mean, you got a great multitude, basically twice your size coming against you, and so they set themselves to seek God. God speaks through his prophet and basically says, All right, in this battle you're not going to have to fight. Does that make any sense? Does that make any sense? It doesn't. It doesn't make any sense to me. You want us to stand still. Right, God? Okay. That's really going to work. But he says, stand still. And he says, don't be afraid or dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground and said, Lord, you are an idiot. Is that what he said? <laughs> Absolutely not. Here's what, here's what Jehoshaphat did. He bowed his face to the ground. And all of Judah with him and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, they bowed before the Lord and they worshipped. They worshipped. Then the Levites and the children of the Korahites and of the children of the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord, God of Israel, with voices loud and high. So they rose in the morning and went out of the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah. And you inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God and you will be established. Believe his prophets and you will prosper. And when he consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of his holiness. And as they went out before the army, were saying, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Now, the, now when they began to sing, now, now think about this now, y'all. Think about this. Hear this. Now when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who had come against Judah and they were defeated. Now where did the ambushes come from? Huh? 
maybe so. But it sure wasn't the people of Israel fighting, or the people of Judah, excuse me. So the Lord had set ambushes against those people, and He defeated them. But the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. Wow. So when Judah came to a place overlooking the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, and there were their dead bodies, fallen all over the earth, and not one of them had escaped. When Jehoshaphat and the people came to take away their spoil, they found among them an abundance of valuables on the dead bodies, precious jewelry which they stripped off for themselves, more than they could carry away. And they were three days gathering the spoil because there was so much. And on the fourth day, the assembly, they assembled in the valley of Berica, for there they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the name of the place was called the valley of of Barakah until this day. Then they returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem with Jehoshaphat in front of them to go back to Jerusalem with joy for the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. So they came to Jerusalem with stringed instruments, harps, and trumpets to the house of the Lord and the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of those countries when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. Then the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet for his God gave him rest all around. So, what is it that you and I can learn about experiencing God from Jehoshaphat? What can we learn about that from him? Well, number one, as he faced this pretty difficult, I would say, uh, situation with his enemy, coming against him, pretty much being outnumbered two to one, how did, how did he respond? I mean, what, what did he do that was so important for you and I today? Number one, he, he chose to seek God. You can just write that down. Number one, he chose to seek the Lord. So what that tells me then is, again, something that you have heard over and over and over as you have studied experiencing God it's talked about the importance of a what with God? A relationship, right? Experiencing God flows out of a real, genuine relationship with God. And so it tells me that because he chose to do this, as we just read in the beginning, right? Verse 2 said, Then they came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, The great multitude is coming against you. Jehoshaphat was scared. And in the midst of his fear, what did he do? He set himself to seek the Lord. Okay? In other words, in the midst of his fear, here's what, here's what Jehoshaphat said. He said, I want to know what God thinks. I want to know what God wants for me to do in this situation. Okay? Now, how many would you would agree that that's, that's probably something that we too should do in our lives as we face various situations like that? Everybody agree with that? Well, why don't we do it? <laughs> why is it that we have a tendency to turn to man? Why is it a tendency that we're going to turn to the flesh for our help. When we know as believers, truly, as the psalmist said, our help comes from the Lord. He is our rock. He is our refuge. And so why is it then that when the difficulties arise in our lives, we want to look to humans. We want to look to our own ability to try to fix a situation. You see, in order to truly experience God, experience God in our lives, something's got to happen in our heart to where we actually care about what God thinks. And as a nation, we've stopped caring about what God thinks. Amen or oh me? I mean, now you may not have, and I hope you haven't. I mean, because that'd be pretty odd that you're sitting in this place in the midst of a, a congregation of believers, and yet in your mind, you're not convinced that what God has to say matters. Okay, But, but I would assume that it's not that way with you. I mean, you're here because you do care what God thinks. And so if you really want to experience God, something's got to happen in your heart to make you care about what God thinks. I was having a conversation this afternoon, which I thought was interesting. I was just hearing a guy share his testimony, and I, as he was sharing, I said, well, you know, what, what made some of the change in your life um, as far as coming to know the Lord? And he said, you know, facing the facts that certain realities were not in my life. In other words, if somebody came and told me that an atomic bomb just went off up at the Big B, 
If they just came and told me that right now, you know what I'd call them? I'd call them a liar. Because you and I know good and well, if atomic bomb goes off, there are certain things that are going to, to occur. We'd probably already be dead by now. Right? I mean, truthfully. Um, so there's just things that are going to happen. And that's the same way it is with being born again. You know, becoming a new creature. The Bible clearly says, old things pass away, behold, all things become new. And so as he began to examine his own life and see that, you know what? This is not present in my life, but yet I say I'm a Christian. You know, that's not present in my life, but yet I still say I'm a Christian. This has never changed in my life, you know, da, da, all these certain things. And so it was like, am I really a Christian? So the reason I word things the way I'm wording it is that, hey, guys, things are not going to, what God thinks about things and what God has to say on certain matters in our life is not going to matter to you till something changes in your heart. You understand that? Until you're fully convinced of who he really is in your life. Well, Jehoshaphat was fully convinced that God was God. And that what he had to say in this issue, no matter how scared he was, no matter how big the enemy was that was coming down against him, it mattered. Okay? So his relationship with the Lord was very important. I really want to know what God says. If you go back, it's really interesting in chapter 18. I encourage you to go back to 17 maybe sometime tonight and read a little bit about him. But uh, it was kind of interesting that uh, Ahab was the king of Israel at this time in chapter 18. And uh, he says to Jehoshaphat one day, king of Judah, will you go with me against Ramoth Gilead? And he answered and he said, I am, I am as you are and my people are as your people. We will be with you in war. Also Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, please inquire for the word of the Lord today. So it's like, okay, Ahab, I hear what you're saying. I'm with you. Our people are with you. But let's ask the Lord about what he thinks. Okay? And so it's cool in chapter 18, verse 5, it says, Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, 400 men, and said to them, Shall we go to the war, go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? So they said, Go up, because God will deliver it to the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat said, Something must have checked in his spirit. And he says, Is there not still a prophet of the Lord here? that we may inquire of him. In other words, he wasn't pleased with those, what those guys had to say about it. He knew something was radically wrong with that. So the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, there is still one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him because he never prophesies good concerning me. Always evil. Isn't that the way tendency we have to do? We kind of gravitate to somebody that's always going to be positive. But sometimes, doggone it, we need to hear the truth whether we like it or not. Right? So Ahab's, now this is the difference in kingship and, 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 and as far as who a man is. Now when you think about Ahab, do you think really about much very good about him? No, probably what comes to your mind is Jezebel and all the mess that went on with all the junk and the prophets of Baal and all that stuff, right? I don't really think of a whole lot good that comes along with Ahab. And now you can kind of understand why. So he's just going to push a guy to the side that he knows in his heart is a true prophet of God just because he has nothing good to say about anything in his life. I think that's interesting, don't you? He says, I hate him because he never prophesies good concerning him. He's Micaiah, the son of Imla. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say such things. The king of Israel called one of his officers and said, bring him to me. And so... Micaiah, you can go on and read this, man. He, he prophesies basically the same thing, okay? But what's interesting is verse 13 of chapter 18. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is a true prophet of the Lord. Here's what he says. As the Lord lives, whatever my God says, that's what I'm going to say. What do you think about that? To me, now, that's a true prophet of God. In other words, you can imply, too, with this, that if God don't say it, I'm not going to say it. So you can count on me, Jehoshaphat. Whatever God says is what I'm going to pass on to you, whether you like it or whether you don't like it. And so it's kind of cool that he goes on and he says, Go and prosper. They will be delivered into your hand. And so the king says, How many times shall I make you swear that you tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? So he was serious, y'all. That's my point. Jehoshaphat was where he was in his life. He got to experience God in mighty ways because he was willing to seek him out. So... 
I love Hebrews 11, verse 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, but He is a rewarder of those who will diligently seek Him. So, that's what we learn from Him. Number two, His relationship with the Lord was important. He wanted to know what God had to say about the issue at hand. But not only that, but His relationship with other believers was important as well. Because what we find happening here back in chapter 20 is we find that uh, Joseph had feared he set himself to seek the Lord. But not only that, but he proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. In other words, he called for the people of God to join him in seeking the Lord. Right? So I think for you and I, just something that we can take from this is that if we truly want to experience with, with God, there's some relationships in our lives that are, that are very important. Number one, our relationship with God. Number two, our relationship with other believers. Okay? Because you know what we have the tendency to do? Oftentimes we're loners and we like to just do it all alone. I thought it was cool this past week on our retreat with those men out, out at the coast. There was one guy there and uh, he was really struggling. His wife is Jehovah's Witness. Man, he opened up and he shared one of the days uh, just how much his heart was broken for his wife who was caught up in that deception, that lie of the whole Jehovah's Witness religion or whatever. And uh, his pastor was telling me later that uh, this was the first time that he had really opened up. And I'll never forget one of the things he said. He said, you know, guys, he said, I'm sick of it. And he said this just bawling, crying like a baby. And he said this, he said, guys, I am sick and tired of trying to do this on my own. I need help. And I need you guys to help me. And I thought, man, what an illustration. Because, you know, there are just times in our lives when we need people to help us. We need people to come along beside of us, man, and literally help hold us up through intercessory prayer, through their encouragement, through their presence of just being with us. Not that they take God's place, but God has given us each other, all right? He's not called us to live the Christian life and grow in the Christian life in a vacuum. He's given us the church. He's made us a body. And he says that every single part of that body is important. And it all works together to accomplish his glorious purpose. Right? So our relationship with him is important. Our relationship with others is important. So we must be willing to, to, to want to know what God has to say and what he thinks on a matter. Above all things. But we also must be willing to say, look, I need your help. I need you to come along and beside of me in this. Because you're, I'm sure some of you are like me. Sometimes, you know, you get so caught up and so overcome with fear about certain things. What do I do? What's going to happen if I do this? That sometimes it's hard to even pray yourself. Right? So the Bible teaches us in James chapter 5, if we find ourselves in that spiritual place, we need to reach out. We need to call other godly people to come alongside of us and pray. Pray with us. Right? So, anyway. Um, another thing. Another thing. Um, to mention here is this. Look at verse number 12 of chapter 20. Basically beginning at verse 6 all the way down through verse 12, we have some insight on the prayer that Jehoshaphat prayed to God as he was seeking him with the people. And uh, acknowledges who God is, acknowledge, acknowledges his power over the nations, and the fact that no one is, is able to withstand him. Um, he's reminded him of his covenant that he's made with, with his people. But, but verse 12 really jumps out at me because it speaks to the, to the heart of Jehoshaphat. And I know it's the kind of heart that God desires to develop in us. Okay? So he's crying out to God. The Bible clearly says he's acknowledging this. We've got no power against this multitude. In other words, he's admitting that he nor the armies that he has have the ability to overcome this enemy that's coming down against him. But he not only admits that, but he also admits that he doesn't know what to do. Now, how many men or how many women do we have today in our world that when they find themselves in the midst of this kind of situation are willing to admit, you know what, I don't have the answers. Nor do I have the ability to fix the situation or the power to fix the situation. I mean, where do you oftentimes see that these days? 
But it speaks to his heart. And he's admitting before God, before all the people, look, we've got no power, nor do we know what to do. But here's what we're going to do. Look at what he says at the end of verse 12. He says, we're going to keep our eyes on you. We're going to keep our eyes on you. Instead of turning to the flesh, instead of turning to other humans, we're going to keep our eyes on you because, God, we want to know what you're doing, when you're doing it, how you're doing it, watching you, so we know the next move to make in our lives. So that leads us to the third point, which is this. We must learn to set our eyes on the Lord instead of the battles that we face. We must set our eyes on the Lord instead of the battles. I don't know about you, but uh, in life, um, it's, it's easy to find yourself in a situation like Jehoshaphat's in a situation that's bigger than you but here's something to remember no matter how big it is it never gets bigger than God it never gets bigger than God right so we got to set our eyes on him instead of the battle and this makes a difference okay it makes a difference in everything about us when we choose to focus on on him instead of the the problem okay number four God speaks right verse 14 the very thing that uh, Jehoshaphat wanted, God does. But he chooses in this point to speak through one of his prophets. Okay? Now let me ask you something. Are you at, at this time currently trying to seek to know God's heart on a certain matter in your life? One of the things that you're going to find as you walk through the study of experiencing God, you're going to hear Dr. Blackaby talk about how God speaks. Right? Right? How does God speak? Now just think about that, not looking for any answers per se here, but, but how does God speak? Well, we know he speaks through his word, but how else does God speak in our lives? What are you, what are you looking for? When you're seeking God for an answer, or to know his heart on a particular matter in your life, how are you looking for him to answer it? I think that's a big deal. Well, in this case, the Bible, the Bible says that God chose to speak through one of his prophets. So the Spirit of the Lord, verse 14, comes upon Jehaziel. I guess that's how you pronounce his name. And he speaks, and he tells them what to do. Okay? So through this prophet, God speaks, and this is where we sort of slow down to sort of look at what God wanted them to do. Verse 15, don't be afraid, don't be dismayed, because of this great multitude. Okay? I understand your situation. I understand why you would be afraid, but here's what you've got to know about this. The battle is not yours. It's God's. It's God's. So that was a promise that was made, right? That was a promise that was made. Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz and so forth, and you will find them at the end of the brook. It's another promise. Verse 17, you will not need to fight in this battle. Another promise. Rather position yourself, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord, that he is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not, be, do not fear nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Another promise, right? Are you getting all this? Promise after promise after promise from God. So number four is this. We must be willing to believe and stand on the promises of God. So when God speaks to you, He shows you what to do, He gives you His promise, what are you going to do with it? I mean, if you're not going to believe, I mean, you know, just think about Jehoshaphat for a second. I mean, could he not have very easily said, no, God, this is not your deal, this is my deal. <laughs> I want to show the people that I'm strong. I want to show them I'm a great king. I want to show them that I can do this and do that and all these different things. He could have basically argued with God and said, no, it's not your battle, it's mine. He could have argued with God. God the, the prophet told him clearly uh, where the enemy would be. He told him clearly what they needed to do. But he could have very easily argued with God and said, hey, your plan is ridiculous. Thus, what you're saying, prophet, could not be from God because what you're asking us to do doesn't make sense. Right? But ladies and gentlemen, that's how we grow to experience God. 
Is I mean, if you're serious about reading the Bible and seeing how he worked in the lives of his people, what God would tell people to do most of the time, guess what? It didn't make sense. It didn't measure up with the normal standard of, okay, just go down there, fight your heart out. Let's play a little Rocky tune. Before we go out, we'll all be fired up. I, the tiger, baby, let's take them down. You know, that's not what he did. So he said, you're not going to need to fight. Just position yourself, stand still, and watch God work. So we must be willing to embrace, believe the promise of the Lord. Okay? Number five, we must be willing to rely on the wisdom and the power of the Lord. And this leads us back to the age-old issue. Our natural tendency is to always try to fix things in our lives. we got a problem, we're going to fix it, right? we got a problem, we're going to deal with it, right? That's how we naturally function. But to truly experience God, we must be willing to rely upon what God says, His wisdom and His power, right? It's easy again to want to rely upon what makes sense, what's logical, but in order to experience God, we must be willing to embrace His wisdom and His plan. And guess what happened? Jehoshaphat and all the people of Judah, they got to go out that day and see an utter miracle. Did they not? They got to see something absolutely amazing. Here it is, y'all. They won a battle, and guess what? They never had to fight. Most of the time you think about a battle, what's going to be involved? It's going to be sweat. It's going to be tears. It's going to be blood. It's going to be death and all of those things. But guess what? Not a single person of Judah died. They didn't have to sweat unless they sweated on walking to where God told them to walk to. They didn't have to shed any blood. They got to see God do a miracle. They won a battle without ever fighting. And ladies and gentlemen, that just don't happen every day. And so when they walked away from this situation, I mean, were they literally bragging about something that they had done? What were they doing? No, when they walked away from this, all they could do was brag about what God had done. See, that's the whole point. That's what it's all bringing us back to. I mean, do you really want to live a life where you're constantly testifying of things that God has done that only He can do? You see, if you continue to want to understand servanthood like we've understood it for hundreds of years here, you know that servanthood is basically just going out and we feel like God really needs us to serve Him, so we just feel like we're just going to go out and we're going to do whatever we think God wants us to do. We're just going to do it and do our best to it. We're going to miss out. But true servanthood is all about just saying, God, here I am. Just like Jehoshaphat. God, I have no power. I don't know what to do. But my eyes are on you. I, I, I'm here. You, you just tell me what to do and we'll do it. And you know what? Jehoshaphat held true. Lord, if you're going to tell us we don't need to fight, if you're going to tell us to position ourselves and not do anything, guess what? That's what we're going to set ourselves to do. Right? So it's not about you going out here and just finding something good to do. I mean, understand what a true Christian is all about. It's about saying, God, here I am. I'm your instrument. You use me to do your work in this world in whatever way you desire to do that. That's what I hope you're learning as you do this study. Because again, it's so easy for us to just to go out and do things and then say, okay, God, I'm going to do this, so why don't you bless what I'm doing? It's a big difference when we, when we say, okay, I'm going to do this, God, you bless it, versus God, I'm going to keep my eyes open, I'm going to watch where you're working, and I'm going to look for the opportunity to join you in whatever you're doing. Right? I mean, tell me something, guys. Just think about this. This is not to hurt. This is to help. But how many of you honestly could raise your hand right now and share a testimony of something that, that just in the last month God did something that only God could do? I mean, really? I mean, how many of you could truly say, you know what, man, I sought God about this and so I just put myself out there and here's how God used me and here's how God showed up. Or how many of us can really mainly talk about what we've done in the church lately? And we can all talk about what we've done in this place. But really, what are we doing out there in the real world where God's at and where God's working? Not to say He doesn't work here, but God's in the world, right? I mean, those harvests, man, those people, they're not in here. They're there. 
God came to seek and to save that which is lost. So where is God working? Where, he's working there. He's in the world. So when we're out there, are our eyes open? Or are we just always looking for the next opportunity to come into the church building and do our work? See, God's not looking for good church workers. He's looking for people who, like Isaiah who will just simply say, God, you're worthy of my life. Here it is. You use it however you see fit. But a lot of times, here's what the people of God are doing. They're over here working in the church, real, real busy, 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 busy bodies, and God's working way over there. I don't say that to criticize anybody's work. Only you know in your heart if you do what you do because God tells you to do it. Only you know that. And I can't criticize that. But you've got to understand I've been a pastor for 15 years and I'm speaking to you as one who has a lot of experience of being busy about doing a lot of things. Being busy over here when God's over there. You see what I'm saying? So, we must be willing to rely upon his wisdom and his power no matter how ridiculous it may sound to us. And we'll find that in the end, faith will always be the victory when we believe. And it's interesting that what did Jehoshaphat call the people of Israel or the people of Judah to do in verse 20? He says, believe in the Lord your God and you will be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. Believe. Embrace His promises. Embrace the plans, the wisdom that He has provided us. Embrace the fact that God is able. It's interesting that in verses 18 through 22, that by faith, the people of Judah along with Jehoshaphat were already praising God for a victory that had not taken place yet. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is faith, is it not? I, I, I mean, man, their mind is convinced, okay, that if God has spoken it, and if this is the way that he's going to win this battle, then this is the way he's going to win this battle. And ladies and gentlemen, they're already demonstrating their faith by praising him and worshiping him before the battle ever takes place. I'm going to tell you, living in our day and time, and I'm just going to use myself because I, I don't know you that well and don't know really how you ultimately deal with things in your life, but you know what I would have done instead of praising and worshiping and claiming victory before it ever happened? I'd have been sitting around chewing my fingernails off. I'd have been sitting around going, oh my goodness, man, I am such an idiot. Everybody around here thinks I'm an idiot. I then stepped out. I'm, I'm planning on trying to fight a battle in a way that's never, ever been done before and all these things. and that, you, know, you know what I'm saying? I'm biting my, oh, is God going to show up? Is he for real? <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, that, that's, what's, that's what's the norm today. But all I know is this, man. Jehoshaphat got to see God do a miracle. And you know what I have in the Word of God? I have the fact that, you know what? God's not like us. Some of you, you know, are not what you used to be, amen? You can't run a 4 4 40 no more, you know? You, you, you can't do this, you can't do that. Your mind's already uh, writing checks that your body can't cash no more, right? Right? I mean, that's for all of us. But the beautiful promise of God is this. He says, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so the same God that Jehoshaphat trusted hundreds of years ago is the same God we serve today through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me ask you, what's holding you back from experiencing God? Let me tell you what's holding you back. When you get home this evening, just go in your bathroom and look in the mirror. And that's who's holding you back. It's you. See, God wants you to know who He is. God wants to reveal Himself to you. God wants an intimate relationship with you. And that's where it starts. You can fight it and trade it for religion all day long if you want to, but that's where it starts. And without it, you'll never experience God. 
So I don't know about you, but as I study just a little bit of the life of Jehoshaphat, God has been so good to us to give us an example of life for him and how he experienced and, and, and nothing's changed. So I honestly believe for us as a church, I want to issue a challenge. Number one, I want to ask you a question that will challenge you. I hope challenge you. Number one, are you saved? I mean, honestly, are you saved or are you just genuinely just flat out playing church? I mean, be honest. I mean, do you know the Lord's made a difference? I mean, has the atomic bomb of grace went off in your heart? Because when it happens, there are going to be things that change about your life. I mean, there's going to be a genuine love for God, number one, but there's also going to be a genuine love for the world. I mean, when you heard Abraham today, I mean, if you thought one thing about India since you left this morning, or were you just basically glad for him to finally get off the platform because you probably couldn't understand anything that he said this morning? I mean, I don't know, but what is your heart for? Because I know God's heart is for the world. It's for people. Right? So are you willing to examine yourself and face the fact that there are certain realities that take place when you are born again? So I'm asking you, are you genuinely saved? Or are you just playing games? You know what? Eternity is way too long to be wrong. How many of you agree with that? Amen. And there's some of you maybe here that are, that are thinking that somehow your good life is going to cover up for the fact that you deserve death and it's not going to happen. we got to believe on Jesus Christ and that's the only hope. You say, good, Pastor, that's where I am. I'm trusting Christ and nothing else. Well, praise God for you. Because it's only through Him you can have a relationship. But let me ask you something. Are you allowing God the opportunity to reveal Himself to you? To develop intimacy between you and Him and your relationship? So I want to challenge you to seek Him. I mean, that the Bible literally in Hebrew, it says that, that, that uh, Jehoshaphat, he set his face. He set his face to seek the Lord. You know, I know there are a lot of flashing lights and there's a lot of things that the enemy makes look good in this life for us. And the sad thing of it is is that not all those things are bad things. And that's pretty sly for him to take good things and use them to get your attention away from what you need to be focused on. So I just want to challenge you. Would you today be willing to turn your face from whatever else might have your attention and turn it solely to the Lord? And say, God, I don't know how many more days you're going to give me on this planet. It might be tonight when I go. It might be tomorrow. It might be a week. It might be a month. It might be years. I don't know. But Lord, I'm willing to set my face to seek you for the rest of my days. I'm willing to throw up my hands and say, God, I, I, all I want to do from now on to the end, till I cross the finish line, is what you want me to do. Because there's some of you that you're busy doing good things but you cannot honestly say in your heart God told you to do them. You do it because it's always been done or you do it because it's a tradition. You just do it because, hey, it's just what you do. But I'm just asking. And maybe it is what God wants you to do, but are you willing to say, Lord, for the rest of my days on this planet, the only thing I want to be doing is what you want me to be doing. And I don't care how ridiculous it may be or may sound when you show it to me. I'm going to trust you, and I'm actually going to claim the victory before it ever happens. Father, we thank you for the day. Number one, Lord, I'm praying. I'm praying hard. I don't want to see anybody in hell. And God, I know the reality is that there are a lot of people going to hell from Baptist church pews. And so, Lord, I'm praying, God, that you will humble the hearts of folks in this room and that you will cause them to face the facts that you will cause them to, to, to think through the fact of God, are there certain realities present in my life that I know without a shadow of a doubt that you made a change in me? And Father, I pray for those who have trusted you, that are truly walking with you, God. I'm praying that you will 
Put a desire in them to set their face to seek you for the rest of their days. And may they only have one burning desire, and that is to finish this life doing nothing more than what you desire them to be doing. God, and I pray that for myself. God, I don't want to live for man. I don't want to live to please man. I don't want to live to, to try and fulfill the expectations of man. I want to live for you. I want to experience you. I want to trust you. I want to claim your promises and victory before God it ever happens, Lord. I want, to, I want to, to walk in those same shoes that Jehoshaphat did. God, it's not so much about him, God. It's about where he was with you. And so, God, I pray that you bring us into such a relationship with you, God, that this becomes the testimony of our lives. Lord, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Amen. Thank y'all. Brother Kelly is going to lead us in our business meeting tonight. So if you're here and you're visiting with us or something, you don't want to hang out, I'm going to give you an opportunity to lead um, if you want to go before he comes. So we'll take about a minute break and let you guys do what you need to do, and then we'll start it up. Okay, well. <laughs> so you read it? Okay, try to read the top. Okay.